Second Part, Chapter One, The Indian Ocean. Now we begin the second part of this voyage under the seas. The first ended in that moving scene at the Coral Cemetery, which left a profound impression on my mind. And so Captain Nemo would live out his life entirely in the heart of this immense sea, and even his grave lay ready in its impenetrable depths. There, the last sleep of the Nautilus's occupants, friends bound together in death as in life, would be disturbed by no monster of the deep. No man, either, the captain had added. Always that same fierce, implacable defiance of human society. As for me, I was no longer content with the hypotheses that satisfied Conseil. That fine lad persisted in seeing the Nautilus's commander as merely one of those unappreciated scientists who repay humanity's indifference with contempt. For Conseil, the captain was still a misunderstood genius who, tired of the world's deceptions, had been driven to take refuge in this inaccessible environment where he was free to follow his instincts. But, to my mind, this hypothesis explained only one side of Captain Nemo. In fact, the mystery of that last afternoon when we were locked in prison and put to sleep the captain's violent precaution of snatching from my grasp a spyglass poised to scour the horizon, and the fatal wound given that man during some unexplained collision suffered by the Nautilus, all led me down a plain trail. No, Captain Nemo wasn't content simply to avoid humanity. His fearsome submersible served not only his quest for freedom, but also, perhaps, it was used in Lord knows what schemes of dreadful revenge. Right now, nothing is clear to me. I still glimpse only glimmers in the dark, and I must limit my pen, as it were, to taking dictation from events. But nothing binds us to Captain Nemo. He believes that escaping from the Nautilus is impossible. We are not even constrained by our word of honor. No promises fetter us. We're simply captives, prisoners masquerading under the name guests, for that sake of everyday courtesy. Even so, Ned Land hasn't given up all hope of recovering his freedom. He's sure to take advantage of the first chance that comes his way. No doubt I will do likewise. And yet I will feel some regret at making off with the Nautilus's secrets so generously unveiled for us by Captain Nemo. Because, ultimately, should we detest or admire this man? Is he the persecutor or the persecuted? And, in all honesty, before I leave him forever, I want to finish this underwater tour of the world, whose first stages have been so magnificent. I want to observe the full series of these wonders gathered under the seas of our globe. I want to see what no man has seen yet, even if I must pay for this insatiable curiosity with my life. What are my discoveries to date? Nothing, relatively speaking, since so far we've covered only six thousand leagues across the Pacific. Nevertheless, I'm well aware that the Nautilus is drawing near to populated shores, and if some chance for salvation becomes available to us, it would be sheer cruelty to sacrifice my companions to my passion for the unknown. I must go with them, perhaps even guide them. But will this opportunity ever arise? The human being, robbed of his free will, craves such an opportunity. But the scientist, forever inquisitive, dreads it. That day, January 21st, 1868, the chief officer went at noon to take the sun's altitude. I climbed onto the platform, lit a cigar, and watched him at work. It seemed obvious to me that this man didn't understand French, because I made several remarks in a loud voice that were bound to provoke him to some involuntary show of interest had he understood them, but he remained mute and emotionless. While he took his sights with his sextant, one of the Nautilus's sailors, that muscular man who had gone with us to Crespo Island during our first underwater excursion, came up to clean the glass panes of the beacon. I then examined the fittings of this mechanism, whose power was increased a hundredfold by biconvex lenses that were designed like those in a lighthouse, and kept its rays productively focused. This electric lamp was so constructed as to yield its maximum illuminating power. In essence, its light was generated in a vacuum, ensuring both its steadiness and intensity. Such a vacuum also reduced wear on the graphite points between which the luminous arc expanded. 
This was an important savings for Captain Nemo, who couldn't easily renew them. But under these conditions, wear and tear were almost non-existent. When the Nautilus was ready to resume its underwater travels, I went below again to the lounge. The hatches closed once more, and our course was set due west. We then plowed the waves of the Indian Ocean, vast liquid plains with an area of 550 million hectares, whose waters are so transparent it makes you dizzy to lean over their surface. There the Nautilus generally drifted at a depth between 100 and 200 meters. It behaved in this way for some days. To anyone without my grand passion for the sea, these hours would surely have seemed long and monotonous. But my daily strolls on the platform where I was revived by the life-giving ocean air, the sights in the rich waters beyond the lounge windows, the books to be read in the library, and the composition of my memoirs took up all my time and left me without a moment of weariness or boredom. All in all, we enjoyed a highly satisfactory state of health. The diet on board agreed with us perfectly, and for my part, I could easily have gone without those changes of pace that Ned Land, in a spirit of protest, kept taxing his ingenuity to supply us. What's more, in this constant temperature we didn't even have to worry about catching colds. Besides, the ship had a good stock of the madrepore dendrophilia, known in Provence by the name sea fennel, and a poultice made from the dissolved flesh of its polyps will furnish an excellent cough medicine. For some days we saw a large number of aquatic birds with webbed feet, known as gulls or sea mews. Some were skillfully slain, and when cooked in a certain fashion, they made a very acceptable platter of water game. Among the great wind riders, carried over long distances from every shore and resting on the waves from their exhausting flights, I spotted some magnificent albatross, birds belonging to the longipens, long-winged family, whose discordant calls sound like the braying of an ass. The toady palms, fully webbed family, was represented by swift frigate birds, nimbly catching fish at the surface, and by numerous tropic birds of the genus Phaeton, among others the red-tailed tropic bird, the size of a pigeon, its white plumage shaded with pink tints that contrasted with its dark-hued wings. The Nautilus's nets hauled up several types of sea turtle from the hawksbill genus, with arcing backs whose scales are highly prized. Diving easily, these reptiles can remain a good while under water by closing the fleshy valves located at the external openings of their nasal passages. When they were captured, some hawkbills were still asleep inside their carapaces, a refuge from other marine animals. The flesh of these turtles was nothing memorable, but their eggs made an excellent feast. As for fish, they always filled us with wonderment when, staring through the open panels, we could unveil the secrets of their aquatic lives. I noted several species I hadn't previously been able to observe. I'll mention chiefly some trunkfish unique to the Red Sea, the Sea of the East Indies, and that part of the ocean washing the coast of equinoctical America. Like turtles, armadillos, sea urchins, and crustaceans, these fish are protected by armor plate that's neither chalky nor stony, but actual bone. Sometimes this armor takes the shape of a solid triangle, sometimes that of a solid quadrangle. Among the triangular type, I noticed some a half a decimeter long, with brown tails, yellow fins, and wholesome, exquisitely tasty flesh. I even recommend that they be acclimatized to the fresh water, a change, incidentally, that a number of saltwater fish can make with ease. I'll also mention some quadrangular trunkfish topped by four large protuberances along the back, trunkfish sprinkled with white spots on the underside of the body, which make good house pets like certain birds, boxfish armed with stings formed by extensions of their bony crust, and whose odd grunting has earned them the nickname sea pigs, then some trunkfish known as dromedaries, with tough leathery flesh and big conical humps. From the daily notes kept by Mr. Conseil, I also retrieved certain fish from the genus Tetradon, unique to these seas. Southern puffers with red backs and white chests, and distinguished by three lengthwise rows of filaments. And jugfish, seven inches long, decked out in the brightest colors. Then, as specimens of other genera, blowfish resembling a dark brown egg, furrowed with white bands and lacking tails. Globefish, genuine porcupines of the sea, armed with stings and able to inflate themselves until they look like a pincushion bristling with needles. 
seahorses common to every ocean, flying dragonfish with long snouts and highly distended pectoral fins shaped like wings, which enable them, if not to fly, at least to spring into the air, spatula-shaped paddlefish whose tails are covered with many scaly rings, snipefish with long jaws, excellent animals twenty-five centimeters long and gleaming with the most cheerful colors, bluish-gray dragonettes with wrinkled heads, myriads of leaping blennies with black stripes and long pectoral fins, gliding over the surface of the water with prodigious speed, delicious sailfish that can hoist their fins in a favorable current like so many unfurled sails, splendid nursery fish on which nature has lavished yellow, azure, silver, and gold, yellow mackerel with wings made of filaments, bullheads forever spattered with mud, which make distinct hissing sounds, sea robins whose livers are thought to be poisonous, ladyfish that can flutter their eyelids, finally archerfish with long tubular snouts, real ocean-going flycatchers armed with a rifle unforeseen by either Remington or Chassapot, it slays insects by shooting them with a simple drop of water. From the eighty-ninth fish genus in La Cepede's system of classification, belonging to his second subclass of bony fish, characterized by gill covers and a bronchial membrane, I notice some scorpion fish whose heads are adorned with stings and which have only one dorsal fin. These animals are covered with small scales, or have none at all, depending on the subgenus to which they belong. The second subgenus gave us some didactylous specimens three to four decimeters long, streaked with yellow, their heads having a phantasmagoric appearance. As for the first subgenus, it furnished several specimens of that bizarre fish aptly nicknamed toadfish, whose big head is sometimes gouged with deep cavities, sometimes swollen with protuberances, bristling with stings and strewn with nodules, it sports hideously irregular horns. Its body and tail are adorned with callosities. Its stings can inflict dangerous injuries. It's repulsive and horrible. From January 21st to the 23rd, the Nautilus traveled at the rate of 250 leagues in 24 hours, hence 540 miles at 22 miles per hour. If, during our trip, we were able to identify these different varieties of fish, it's because they were attracted by our electric light and tried to follow alongside. But most of them were outdistanced by our speed and soon fell behind. Temporarily, however, a few managed to keep pace in the Nautilus's waters. On the morning of the 24th, in latitude 12 degrees 5 hours south and longitude 94 degrees 33 hours, we raised Keeling Island, a madreporic upheaving planted with magnificent coconut trees, which had been visited by Mr. Darwin and Captain Fitzroy. The Nautilus cruised along a short distance off the shore of this desert island. Our dragnets brought up many specimens of polyps and echidnoderms, plus some unusual shells from the branch mollusca. Captain Nemo's treasures were enhanced by some valuable exhibits from the Delphinula snail species, to which I joined some pointed star coral, a sort of parasitic polypry that often attaches itself to seashells. Soon Keeling Island disappeared below the horizon and our course was set to the northwest, toward the tip of the Indian Peninsula. Civilization, Ned Land told me that day, much better than those Pauppin Islands where we ran into more savages than venison. On this Indian shore, Professor, there are roads and railways, English, French, and Hindu villages. We wouldn't go five miles without bumping into a fellow countryman. Come on now, isn't it time for our sudden departure from Captain Nemo? No, no, Ned, I replied in a very firm tone. Let's ride it out, as you seafaring fellows say. The Nautilus is approaching populated areas. It's going back toward Europe. Let it take us there. After we arrive in home waters, we can do as we see fit. Besides, I don't imagine Captain Nemo will let us go hunting off the coasts of Malabar or Coromandel as he did in the forests of New Guinea. Well, sir, can't we manage without his permission? I didn't answer the Canadian. I wanted no arguments. 
Deep down I was determined to fully exploit the good fortune that had put me on board the Nautilus. After leaving Keeling Island, our pace got generally slower. It also got more unpredictable, often taking us to great depths. Several times we used our slanting fins, which internal levers could set at an oblique angle to our waterline. Thus we went as deep as two or three kilometers down, but without ever verifying the lowest depths of this sea near India, which soundings of 13,000 meters have been unable to reach. As for the temperature in these lower strata, the thermometer always and invariably indicated four degrees centigrade. I merely observed that in the upper layers the water was always colder over shallows than in the open sea. On January 25th, the ocean being completely deserted, the Nautilus spent the day on the surface, churning the waves with its powerful propeller and making them spurt to great heights. Under these conditions, who wouldn't have mistaken it for a gigantic cetacean? I spent three quarters of the day on the platform. I stared at the sea. Nothing on the horizon except near four o'clock in the afternoon, a long steamer to the west, running on our opposite tack. Its masting was visible for an instant, but it couldn't have seen the Nautilus because we were lying too low in the water. I imagine that steamboat belonged to the Peninsular and Oriental Line, which provides service from the island of Ceylon to Sydney, also calling it King George Sound in Melbourne. At five o'clock in the afternoon, just before that brief twilight that links day with night in tropical zones, Conseil and I marveled at an unusual sight. It was a delightful animal whose discovery, according to the ancients, is a sign of good luck. Aristotle, Athenius, Pliny, and Oppian studied its habits and lavished on its behalf all the scientific poetry of Greece and Italy. They called it Nautilus and Pompilius. But modern science has not endorsed these designations, and this mollusk is now known by the name Argonaut. Anyone consulting Conseil would soon learn from the gallant lad that the branch mollusca is divided into five classes. That the first class features Cephalopoda, whose members are sometimes naked, sometimes covered with a shell, which consists of two families, the Dibranchiata and the Tetrabranchiata, which are distinguished by their number of gills. That the family Dibranchiata includes three genera, the Argonaut, the Squid, and the Cuttlefish, and that the family Tetrabranchiata contains only one genus, the Nautilus. After this catalogue, if some recalcitrant listener confuses the Argonaut, which is Acetabuliferous, in other words a bearer of suction tubes, with the Nautilus, which is Tentaculiferous, a bearer of tentacles, it will be simply unforgivable. Now, it was a school of Argonauts then voyaging on the surface of the ocean. We could count several hundred of them. They belonged to that species of Argonaut covered with protuberances and exclusive to the seas near India. These graceful mollusks were swimming backwards by means of their locomotive tubes, sucking water into these tubes and then expelling it. Six of their eight tentacles were long, thin, and floated on the water, while the other two were rounded into palms and spread to the wind like light sails. I could see perfectly their undulating spiral-shaped shells, which Cuiver aptly compared to an elegant cockleboat. It's an actual boat, indeed. It transports the animal that secretes it without the animal sticking to it. The Argonaut is free to leave its shell, I told Conseil, but it never does. Not unlike Captain Nemo, Conseil replied sagely, which is why he should have christened the ship the Argonaut. For about an hour the Nautilus cruised the midst of this school of mollusks. Then, Lord knows why, they were gripped with a sudden fear. As if at a signal, every sail was abruptly lowered. Arms folded, bodies contracted, shells turned over by changing their center of gravity, and the whole flotilla disappeared under the waves. It was instantaneous, and no squadron of ships ever maneuvered with greater togetherness. Just then the night fell suddenly, and the waves barely surged in the breeze, spreading placidly around the Nautilus's side plates. The next day, January 26th, we cut the equator on the 82nd meridian, and we re-entered the northern hemisphere. During that day a fearsome school of sharks provided us with an escort, dreadful animals that teem in these seas and make them extremely dangerous. 
There were Port Jackson sharks with a brown back, a whitish belly, and eleven rows of teeth. Big eye sharks with necks marked by a large black spot encircled in white and resembling an eye, and Isabella sharks whose rounded snouts were strewn with dark speckles. Often these powerful animals rushed at the lounge window with a violence less than comforting. By this point Ned Land had lost all self-control. He wanted to rise to the surface of the waves and harpoon these monsters, especially certain smooth hound sharks, whose mouths were paved with teeth arranged like a mosaic, and some big five-meter tiger sharks that insisted on personally provoking him. But the Nautilus soon picked up speed and easily left to stern the fastest of these man-eaters. On January 27th, at the entrance to the huge bay of Bengal, we repeatedly encountered a gruesome sight human corpses floating on the surface of the waves. Carried by the Ganges to the high seas, these were deceased Indian villagers who hadn't been fully devoured by vultures, the only morticians in these parts. But there was no shortage of sharks to assist them with their undertaking chores. Near seven o'clock in the evening, the Nautilus lay half-submerged, navigating in the midst of milky white waves. As far as the eye could see, the ocean seemed lactified, was it an effect of the moon's rays? No, because the new moon was barely two days old and was still lost below the horizon in the sun's rays. The entire sky, although lit up by stellar radiation, seemed pitch black in comparison with the whiteness of these waters. Conseil couldn't believe his eyes, and he questioned me about the causes of this odd phenomenon. Luckily, I was in a position to answer him. That's called a milk sea, I told him. A vast expanse of white waves often seen along the coast of Amboina and in these waterways. But, Conseil asked, could Master tell me the cause of this effect, because I presume this water hasn't really changed into milk? No, my boy, and this whiteness that amazes you is merely due to the presence of myriads of tiny creatures called infusoria, a sort of diminutive glowworm that's colorless and gelatinous in appearance, as thick as a strand of hair, and no longer than one-fifth of a millimeter. Some of these tiny creatures stick together over an area of several leagues. Several leagues! Conseil exclaimed. Yes, my boy, and don't even try to compute the number of these infusoria. You won't pull it off, because, if I'm not mistaken, certain navigators have cruised through milk seas for more than forty miles. I'm not sure that Conseil heeded my recommendation, because he seemed to be deep in thought, no doubt trying to calculate how many one-fifths of a millimeter are found in forty square miles. As for me, I continued to observe this phenomenon. For several hours, the Nautilus's spur sliced through these whitish waves, and I watched it glide noiselessly over this soapy water, as if it were cruising through those foaming eddies that obeys currents and counter-currents sometimes leave between each other. Near midnight the sea suddenly resumed its usual hue, but behind us, all the way to the horizon, the skies kept mirroring the whiteness of those waves, and for a good while seemed imbued with the hazy glow of an aurora borealis. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 A New Proposition from Captain Nemo On January 28th, in latitude 9 degrees, 4 minutes north, when the Nautilus returned at noon to the surface of the sea, it lay in sight of land some eight miles to the west. Right off, I observed a cluster of mountains about two thousand feet high, whose shapes were very whimsically sculpted. After our position fix, I re-entered the lounge, and when our bearings were reported on the chart, I saw that we were off the island of Ceylon, that pearl dangling from the lower lobe of the Indian Peninsula. I went looking in the library for a book about this island, one of the most fertile in the world. Sure enough, I found a volume entitled Ceylon and the Singhalese by H. C. Sir, Esquire. Re-entering the lounge, I first noted the bearings of Ceylon, on which antiquity lavished so many different names. It was located between latitude 5 degrees 55 minutes and 9 degrees 49 minutes north and between longitude 79 degrees 42 minutes and 82 degrees 4 minutes east of the meridian of Greenwich. Its length is 275 miles, its maximum width 
150 miles, its circumference 900 miles, its surface area 24,448 square miles, in other words a little smaller than that of Ireland. Just then Captain Nemo and his chief officer appeared. The captain glanced at the chart, then turning to me, the island of Ceylon, he said, is famous for its pearl fisheries. Would you be interested, Professor Aronnax, in visiting one of these fisheries? Certainly, Captain. Fine. It's easily done. Only when we see the fisheries, we'll see no fishermen. The annual harvest hasn't begun. No matter. I'll give the orders to make for the Gulf of Manar, and we'll arrive there late tonight. The captain said a few words to his chief officer, who went out immediately. Soon the Nautilus re-entered its liquid element, and the pressure gauge indicated that it was staying at a depth of 30 feet. With the chart under my eyes, I looked for the Gulf of Manar. I found it by the ninth parallel off the northwestern shores of Ceylon. It was formed by the long curve of the little Manar Island. To reach it, we had to go all the way up Ceylon's west coast. Professor, Captain Nemo then told me. There are pearl fisheries in the Bay of Bengal, the seas of the East Indies, the seas of China and Japan, plus those seas south of the United States, the Gulf of Panama and the Gulf of California. But it's off Ceylon that such fishing reaps its richest rewards. No doubt we'll be arriving a little early. Fishermen gather in the Gulf of Manar only during the month of March and for thirty days some three hundred boats concentrate on the lucrative harvest of these treasures from the sea. Each boat is manned by ten oarsmen and ten fishermen. The latter divide into two groups, dive in rotation, and descend to a depth of twelve meters with the help of a heavy stone clutched between their feet and attached by a rope to their boat. You mean, I said, that such primitive methods are still all that they use? All, Captain Nemo answered me, although these fisheries belong to the most industrialized people in the world, the English, to whom the Treaty of Amiens granted them in 1802. Yet it strikes me that diving suits like yours could perform yeoman service in such work. Yes, since those poor fishermen can't stay long under water. On his voyage to Ceylon, the Englishman Percival made much of a kaffir who stayed under five minutes without coming up to the surface. But I find that hard to believe. I know that some divers can last up to 57 seconds, and highly skillful ones to 87, but such men are rare, and when those poor fellows climb back on board, the water is coming out of their noses and ears is tinged with blood. I believe the average time underwater that these fishermen can tolerate is 30 seconds, during which they hastily stuff their little nets with all the pearl oysters they can tear loose. But these fishermen generally don't live to an advanced age. Their vision weakens, ulcers break out on their eyes, sores form on their bodies, and some are even stricken with apoplexy on the ocean floor. Yes, I said, it's a sad occupation and one that exists only to gratify the whims of fashion. But tell me, Captain, how many oysters can a boat fish up in a workday? About forty to fifty thousand. It's even said that in 1814, when the English government went fishing on its own behalf, its divers worked just twenty days and brought up seventy-six million oysters. At least, I said, the fishermen are well paid, aren't they? Hardly, Professor. In Panama, they make just one dollar per week. In most places they earn only a penny for each oyster that has a pearl, and they bring up so many that have none. Only one penny to those poor people who make their employers rich? That's atrocious! On that note, Professor, Captain Nemo told me, you and your companions will visit the Manar Oyster Bank, and if by chance some eager fisherman arrives early, well, we can watch him at work. That suits me, Captain. By the way, Professor Aranax, you aren't afraid of sharks, are you? Sharks! I exclaimed. This struck me as a pretty needless question, to say the least. Well, Captain Nemo went on, 
I admit, Captain, I'm not yet on very familiar terms with that genus of fish. We're used to them, the rest of us, Captain Nemo answered, and in time you will be too. Anyhow, we'll be armed, and on our way we might hunt a man-eater or two. It's a fascinating sport. So, Professor, I'll see you tomorrow, bright and early. This said in a carefree tone, Captain Nemo left the lounge. If you're invited to hunt bears in the Swiss mountains, you might say, Oh, good! I get to go bear hunting tomorrow. If you're invited to hunt lions on the Atlas Plains or tigers in the jungles of India, you might say, Ha! Now's my chance to hunt lions and tigers. But if you're invited to hunt sharks in their native element, you might want to think it over before accepting. As for me, I passed a hand over my brow, where beads of cold sweat were busy forming. Let's think this over, I said to myself, and let's take our time. Hunting otters in underwater forests, as we did in the forests of Crespo Island, is an acceptable activity. But to roam in the bottom of the sea, when you're almost certain to meet man-eaters in the neighborhood, that's another story. I know that in certain countries, particularly the Andaman Islands, Negroes don't hesitate to attack sharks, dagger in one hand and noose in the other. But I also know that many who face those fearsome animals don't come back alive. Besides, I'm not a Negro, and even if I were a Negro, in this instance I don't think a little hesitation on my part would be out of place. And there I was, fantasizing about sharks, envisioning huge jaws armed with multiple rows of teeth and capable of cutting a man in half. I could already feel a definite pain around my pelvic girdle, and how I resented the offhand manner in which the captain had extended his deplorable invitation. You would have thought it an issue of going into the woods on some harmless fox hunt. Thank heavens, I said to myself. Conseil will never want to come along, and that will be my excuse for not going with the captain. As for Ned Land, I admit I felt less confident of his wisdom. Danger, however great, held a perennial attraction for his aggressive nature. I went back to reading Sir's book, but I leafed through it mechanically. Between the lines I kept seeing fearsome, wide-open jaws. Just then, Conseil and the Canadian entered with a calm, even gleeful air. Little did they know what was waiting for them. Ye gods, sir, Ned Land told me, your Captain Nemo, the devil take him, has just made us a very pleasant proposition. Oh, I said, you know about, with all due respect to Master, Conseil replied, the Nautilus's commander has invited us, together with Master, for a visit tomorrow to Ceylon's magnificent pearl fisheries. He did so in the most cordial terms and conducted himself like a true gentleman. He didn't tell you anything else? Nothing, sir, the Canadian replied. He said you'd already discussed this little stroll. Indeed, I said. But didn't he give you any details on... Not a one, Mr. Naturalist. You will be going with us, right? Me? Why, yes, certainly, of course. I can see that you like the idea, Mr. Land. Yes, it will be a really unusual experience. And possibly dangerous? I added in an insinuating tone. Dangerous? Ned Land replied. A simple trip to an oyster bank? Assuredly, Captain Nemo hadn't seen fit to plant the idea of sharks in the minds of my companions. For my part, I stared at them with anxious eyes, as if they were already missing a limb or two. Should I alert them? Yes, surely, but I hardly knew how to go about it. Would Master, Conseil said to me, give us some background on pearl fishing? On the fishing itself, I asked, or on the occupational hazards that... On the fishing, the Canadian replied. Before we tackle the terrain, it helps to be familiar with it. All right, sit down, my friends, and I'll teach you everything I myself have just been taught by the Englishman H.C. Sir. 
Ned and Conseil took seats on a couch, and right off the Canadian said to me, Sir, just what is a pearl exactly? My gallant Ned, I replied, for poets, a pearl is a tear from the sea. For orientals, it's a drop of solidified dew. For the ladies, it's a jewel that they can wear on their fingers, necks, and ears that's oblong in shape, glassy in luster, and formed from mother of pearl. For chemists, it's a mixture of calcium phosphate and calcium carbonate with a little gelatin protein. And finally, for naturalists, it's a simple festering secretion from the organ that produces mother of pearl in certain bivalves. Branch, mollusa, Conseil said. Class, acephala. Order, tessacea. Correct, my scholarly Conseil. Now then, those tessacea capable of producing pearls include rainbow abalone, turbo snails, giant clams, and saltwater scallops. Briefly, all those that secrete mother of pearl, in other words, that blue, azure, violet, or white substance lining the insides of their valves. Are muscles included too? the Canadian asked. Yes, the muscles of certain streams in Scotland, Wales, Ireland, Saxony, Bohemia, and France. Good, the Canadian replied. From now on, we'll pay closer attention to them. But, I went on, for secreting pearls, the ideal mollusk is the pearl oyster Melagrina margaritifera, that valuable shellfish. Pearls result simply from mother-of-pearl solidifying into a globular shape. Either they stick to the oyster's shell, or they become embedded in the creature's folds. On the valves, a pearl sticks fast. On the flesh, it lies loose. But its nucleus is always some small, hard object, say a sterile egg or a grain of sand, around which the mother of pearl is deposited in thin, concentric layers over several years in succession. Can one find several pearls in the same oyster? Conseil asked. Yes, my boy. There are even some shellfish that turn into real jewel coffers. They even mention one oyster, about which I remain dubious, that supposedly contained at least 150 sharks. 150 sharks? Ned Land yelped. Did I say sharks? I exclaimed hastily. I meant 150 pearls. Sharks wouldn't make sense. Indeed, Conseil said. But will Master now tell us how one goes about extracting these pearls? One proceeds in several ways. And often, when pearls stick to the valves, fishermen even pull them loose with pliers. But usually the shellfish are spread out on mats made from asparto grass that covers the beaches. Thus, they die in the open air, and by the end of ten days they've rotted sufficiently. Next, they're immersed in huge tanks of salt water. Then they're opened up and washed. At this point, the sorters begin their twofold task. First, they remove the layers of mother-of-pearl which are known in the industry by the names legitimate silver, bastard white, or bastard black. And then these are shipped out in cases weighing 125 to 150 kilograms. Then they remove the oyster's meaty tissue, boil it, and finally strain it in order to extract even the smallest pearls. Do the prices of these pearls differ depending on their size? Conseil asked. Not only on their size, I replied, but also according to their shape their water, in other words, their color, and their orient. In other words, that dappled, shimmering glow that makes them so delightful to the eye. The finest pearls are called virgin pearls, or paragons. They form an isolation within the mollusk's tissue. They're white, often opaque, but sometimes of opalescent transparency, and usually spherical or pear-shaped. The spherical ones are made into bracelets, the pear-shaped ones into earrings, and since they're the most valuable, they're priced individually. The other pearls that stick to the oyster's shell are more erratically shaped and are priced by weight. Finally, classed in the lowest order, the smallest pearls are known by the name seed pearls. They're priced by the measuring cup and are used mainly in the creation of embroidery for church vestments. 
But it must be a long, hard job sorting out these pearls by size, the Canadian said. No, my friend, that task is performed with eleven strainers, or sieves, that are pierced with different numbers of holes. Those pearls staying in the strainers with twenty to eighty holes are in the first order. Those not slipping through the sieves pierced with one hundred to eight hundred holes are in the second order. Finally, those pearls for which one uses strainers pierced with nine hundred to one thousand holes make up the seed pearls. How ingenious, Conseil said, to reduce dividing and classifying pearls to a mechanical operation. And could Master tell us the profits brought in by harvesting these banks of pearl oysters? According to Sir's book, I replied, these Ceylon fisheries are farmed annually for a total profit of three million man-eaters. Franks! Conseil rebuked. Yes, francs. Three million francs, I went on. But I don't think these fisheries bring in the returns they once did. Similarly, the Central American fisheries used to make an annual profit of four million francs during the reign of King Charles V. But now they bring in only two-thirds of that amount. All in all, it's estimated that nine million francs is the current yearly return for the whole pearl harvesting industry. But, Conseil asked, haven't certain famous pearls been quoted at extremely high prices? Yes, my boy. They say Julius Caesar gave Servilia a pearl worth 1,200,000 francs in our currency. I've even heard stories, the Canadian said, about some lady in ancient times who drank pearls in vinegar. Cleopatra, Conseil shot back. It must have tasted pretty bad, Ned Land added. Abominable. Ned, my friend, Conseil replied, but when a little glass of vinegar is worth 1,500,000 francs, its taste is a small price to pay. I'm sorry I didn't marry that gal, the Canadian said, throwing up his hands with an air of discouragement. Ned Land married to Cleopatra, Conseil exclaimed. But I was all set to tie the knot, Conseil, the Canadian replied in all seriousness, and it wasn't my fault the whole business fell through. I even bought a pearl necklace for my fiancée, Kate Tender, but she married somebody else instead. Well, that necklace cost me only a dollar fifty, but you can absolutely trust me on this, Professor. Its pearls were so big, they wouldn't have gone through that strainer with twenty holes. My gallant Ned, I replied, laughing, those were artificial pearls, ordinary glass beads, whose insides were coated with essence of orient. Wow! the Canadian replied. That essence of Orient must sell for quite a large sum. As little as zero. It comes from the scales of a European carp. It's nothing more than a silver substance that collects in the water and is preserved in ammonia. It's worthless. Maybe that's why Kate Tender married somebody else, replied Mr. Land philosophically. But, I said, getting back to pearls of great value, I don't think any sovereign ever possessed one superior to the pearl owned by Captain Nemo. This one, Conseil said, pointing to a magnificent jewel in its glass case. Exactly. And I'm certainly not far off when I estimate its value at two million um, francs, Conseil said quickly. Yes, I said, two million francs. And no doubt all it cost our captain was the effort to pick it up. Ha! <laughs> Ned Land exclaimed. During our stroll tomorrow, who says we won't run into one just like it? Bah! Conseil put in. And why not? What good would a pearl worth millions do us here on the Nautilus? Here, no, Ned Land said. But elsewhere... Oh, elsewhere, Conseil put in, shaking his head. In fact, I said, Mr. Land is right. And if we ever brought back to Europe or America a pearl worth millions, it would make the story of our adventures more authentic and much more rewarding. That's how I see it, the Canadian said. But, said Conseil, who perpetually returned to the didactic side of things, is this pearl fishing ever dangerous? No, I replied quickly, especially if one takes certain precautions. What risks would you run in a job like that, Ned Land said, swallowing a few gulps of salt water? What have you say, Ned? Then, trying to imitate Captain Nemo's carefree tone, I asked, 
By the way, gallant Ned, are you afraid of sharks? Me? the Canadian replied. I'm a professional harpooner. It's my job to make a mockery of them. It isn't an issue, I said, of fishing for them with a swivel hook, hoisting them onto a deck of a ship, chopping off the tail with a sweep of an axe, opening the belly, ripping out the heart, and tossing it into the sea. So it's an issue of... Yes, precisely. In the water? In the water. Ye gods! Just give me a good harpoon. You see, sir, these sharks are badly designed. They have to roll their bellies over to snap you up, and in the meantime... Ned Land had a way of pronouncing the word snap that sent chills down my spine. Well, how about you, Conseil? What are your feelings about these man-eaters? Me? Conseil said. I'm afraid I must be frank with Master. Good for you, I thought. If Master faces these sharks, Conseil said, I think his loyal manservant should face them with him. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 A Pearl Worth Ten Million Night fell. I went to bed. I slept pretty poorly. Man-eaters played a major role in my dreams, and I found it more or less appropriate that the French word for shark, requin, has its linguistic roots in the word requiem. The next day at four o'clock in the morning I was awakened by the steward, whom Captain Nemo had placed expressly at my service. I got up quickly, dressed, and went into the lounge. Captain Nemo was waiting for me. "'Professor Aranax,' he said to me, "'are you ready to start?' "'I am ready. Kindly follow me.' "'What about my companions, Captain? "'They've been alerted and are waiting for us.' "'Aren't we going to put on our diving suits?' I asked. "'Not yet. I haven't let the Nautilus pull too near the coast, "'and we're fairly well out from the Manor Oyster Bank.' but I have the skiff ready, and it will take us to the exact spot where we'll disembark, which will save us a pretty long trek. It's carrying our diving equipment, and will suit up just before we begin our underwater exploring. Captain Nemo took me to the central companionway, whose steps led to the platform. Ned and Conseil were there, enraptured with the pleasure trip getting underway. Oars in position, five of the Nautilus's sailors were waiting for us aboard the skiff, which was moored alongside. The night was still dark. Layers of clouds cloaked the sky and left only a few stars in view. My eyes flew to the side where land lay, but I saw only a blurred line covering three-quarters of the horizon from southwest to northwest. Going up Ceylon's west coast during the night, the Nautilus lay west of the bay, or rather that gulf formed by the mainland and Manar Island. Under these dark waters there stretched the bank of shellfish, an inexhaustible field of pearls more than twenty miles long. Captain Nemo, Conseil, Ned Land, and I found seats in the stern of the skiff. The longboat's coxswain took the tiller. His four companions leaned into their oars. The moorings were cast off and we pulled clear. The skiff headed southward. The oarsmen took their time. I watched their strokes vigorously catch the water, and they always waited ten seconds before rowing again, following the practice used in most navies. While the long boat coasted, drops of liquid flicked from the oars and hit the dark troughs of the waves, pitter-pattering like splashes of molten lead. Coming from well out, a mild swell made the skiff roll gently, and a few cresting billows lapped at its bow. We were silent. What was Captain Nemo thinking? Perhaps that this approaching shore was too close for comfort, contrary to the Canadian's views in which it still seemed too far away. As for Conseil, he had come along out of simple curiosity. Near 5.30 the first glimmers of light on the horizon defined the upper lines of the coast with greater distinctness. Fairly flat to the east, it swelled a little towards the south. Five miles still separated it from us, and its beach merged with the misty waters. Between us and the shore the sea was deserted. Not a boat, not a diver. Profound solitude reigned over this gathering place of pearl fishermen. As Captain Nemo had commented, we were arriving in these waterways a month too soon. 
At six o'clock the day broke suddenly, with that speed unique to tropical regions, which experience no real dawn or dusk. The sun's rays pierced the cloud curtain gathered on the easterly horizon, and the radiant orb rose swiftly. I could clearly see the shore, which featured a few sparse trees here and there. The skiff advanced towards Manar Island, which curved to the south. Captain Nemo stood up from his thwart and studied the sea. At his signal the anchor was lowered, but its chain barely ran because the bottom lay no more than a meter down, and this locality was one of the shallowest spots near the bank of shellfish. Instantly the skiff wheeled around under the ebb tide's outbound thrust. Here we are, Professor Aranax, Captain Nemo then said. You observe this confined bay. A month from now, in this very place, the numerous fishing boats of the harvesters will gather, and these are the waters their divers will ransack so daringly. This bay is felicitously laid out for their type of fishing. It's sheltered from the strongest winds, and the sea is never very turbulent here. Highly favorable conditions for diving work. Now let's put on our underwater suits, and we'll begin our stroll. I didn't reply, and while staring at these suspicious waves, I began to put on my heavy aquatic clothes, helped by the longboat sailors. Captain Nemo and his two companions suited up as well. None of the Nautilus's men were to go with us on this new excursion. Soon we were imprisoned up to the neck in India rubber clothing, and straps fastened the air devices onto our backs. As for the Rookmorph device, it didn't seem to be in the picture. Before inserting my head into its copter capsule, I commented on this to the captain. "'Our lighting equipment will be useless to us,' the captain assured me. "'We won't be going very deep, and the sun's rays will be sufficient to light our way. Besides, it's unwise to carry electric lanterns under these waves. Their brightness might unexpectedly attract certain dangerous occupants of these waterways.' As Captain Nemo pronounced these words, I turned to Conseil and Ned Land but my two friends had already encased their craniums in their metal headgear, and they could neither hear nor reply. I had one question left to address to Captain Nemo. "'What about our weapons?' I asked him. "'Our rifles.' "'Rifles? What for? Don't your mountaineers attack bears dagger in hand? And isn't steel surer than lead? Here's a sturdy blade. Slip it under your belt and let's be off.' I stared at my companions. They were armed in the same fashion, and Ned Land was also brandishing an enormous harpoon he had stowed in the skiff before leaving the Nautilus. Then, following the captain's example, I let myself be crowned with my heavy copper sphere, and our air tanks immediately went into action. An instant later the longboat sailors helped us overboard one after the other, and we set foot on level sand in a meter and a half of water. Captain Nemo gave us a hand signal. We followed him down a gentle slope and disappeared under the waves. There the obsessive veers in my brain left me. I became surprisingly calm again. The ease with which I could move increased my confidence, and the many strange sights captivated my imagination. The sun was already sending sufficient light under these waves. The tiniest objects remained visible. After ten minutes of walking, we were in five meters of water, and the terrain had become almost flat. Like a covey of snipe over a marsh, there rose underfoot schools of unusual fish from the genus Monopterus, whose members have no fin but their tail. I recognized the Javanese eel, a genuine eight-decimeter serpent with a bluish-gray belly, which, without the gold lines over its flanks, could easily be confused with the conger eel. From the butterfish genus, whose oval bodies are very flat, I observed several adorned in brilliant colors and sporting a dorsal fin like a sickle. Edible fish that, when dried and marinated, made an excellent dish known by the name Carawad. Then some sea poachers, fish belonging to the genus Aspidophoridos, whose bodies are covered with scaly armor divided into eight lengthwise sections. Meanwhile, as the sun got progressively higher, it lit up the watery mass more and more. The sea floor changed little by little. Its fine-grained sand was followed by a genuine causeway of smooth crags, covered by a carpet of mollusks and zoophytes. Among other specimens in these two branches, I noticed some window-pane oysters with thin valves of unequal size, a type of ostracod unique to the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean, then orange-hued lucina with circular shells, all shaped auger shells, some of those Persian murex snails that supply the Nautilus with such wonderful dye, 
spiky periwinkles fifteen centimeters long that rose under the waves like hands ready to grab you, turban snails with shells made of horn and bristling all over with spines, lamp shells, edible duck clams that feed the Hindu marketplace, subtly luminous jellyfish of the species Pelagia panopuria, and finally some wonderful Oculina flabiliforma, magnificent sea fans that fashion one of the most luxuriant tree forms in this ocean. In the midst of this moving vegetation, under arbors of water plants, there race legions of clumsy articulates, in particular some fanged frog crabs, whose carapaces form a slightly rotund triangle, robber crabs exclusive to these waterways, and horrible parthenope crabs whose appearance was repulsive to the eye. One animal no less hideous, which I encountered several times, was the enormous crab that Mr. Darwin observed, to which nature has given the instinct and requisite strength to eat coconuts. It scrambles up trees on the beach and sends the coconuts tumbling. They fracture in their fall and are opened by its powerful pincers. Here, under these clear waves, this crab raced around with matchless agility, while green turtles from the species frequenting the Malabar coast move sluggishly among the crumbling rocks. Near seven o'clock we finally surveyed the bank of shellfish, where pearl oysters reproduce by the millions. These valuable mollusks stick to rocks, where they're strongly attached by a mass of brown filaments that forbids their moving about. In this respect, oysters are inferior even to mussels, to whom nature has not denied all talent for locomotion. The shellfish Meligrina, that womb for pearls whose valves are nearly equal in size, has the shape of a round shell with thick walls and a very rough exterior. Some of these shells were furrowed with flaky greenish bands that radiated down from the top. These were the young oysters. The others had rugged black surfaces, measured up to fifteen centimeters in width, and were ten or more years old. Captain Nemo pointed to this prodigious heap of shellfish, and I saw that these mines were genuinely inexhaustible, since nature's creative powers are greater than man's destructive instincts. True to those instincts, Ned Land greedily stuffed the finest of these mollusks into a net he carried at his side. But we couldn't stop. We had to follow the captain, who headed down trails seemingly known only to himself. The sea floor rose noticeably, and when I lifted my arm, sometimes they would pass above the surface of the sea. Then the level of the oyster bank would lower unpredictably. Often we went around tall, pointed rocks, rising like pyramids. In their dark crevices, huge crustaceans, aiming their long legs like heavy artillery, watched us with unblinking eyes, while underfoot there crept millipedes, bloodworms, aricia worms, and anelid worms, whose antennas and tubular tentacles were incredibly long. Just then a huge cave opened up in our path, hollowed from a picturesque pile of rocks whose smooth heights were completely hung with underwater flora. At first this cave looked pitch black to me. Inside, the sun's rays seemed to diminish by degrees. Their hazy transparency was nothing more than drowned light. Captain Nemo went in. We followed him. My eyes soon grew accustomed to this comparative gloom. I distinguished the unpredictably contoured springings of a vault, supported by natural pillars firmly based on a granite foundation, like the weighty columns of Tuscan architecture. Why had our incomprehensible guide taken us into the depths of this underwater crypt? I would soon find out. After going down a fairly steep slope, our feet trod the floor of a sort of circular pit. There Captain Nemo stopped, and his hand indicated an object that I hadn't yet noticed. It was an oyster of extraordinary dimensions, a titanic giant clam, a holy water font that could have held a whole lake, a basin more than two meters wide, hence even bigger than the one adorning the Nautilus's lounge. I approached this phenomenal mollusk. Its massive filaments attached it to a table of granite, and there it grew by itself in the midst of the cave's calm waters. I estimated the weight of this giant clam at three hundred kilograms. Hence such an oyster held fifteen kilos of meat, and you'd need the stomach of King Gargantua to eat a couple dozen. Captain Nemo was obviously familiar with this bivalve's existence. This wasn't the first time he'd paid it a visit, and I thought his sole reason for leading us to this locality was to show us a natural curiosity. I was mistaken. Captain Nemo had an explicit personal interest in checking on the current condition of this giant clam. The mollusk's two valves were partly open. The captain approached and stuck his dagger vertically between the shells to discourage any ideas about closing. Then, with his hands, he raised the fringed, membrane-filled tunic that made up the animal's mantle. 
There, between its leaf-like folds, I saw a loose pearl as big as a coconut. Its globular shape, perfect clarity, and wonderful orient made it a jewel of incalculable value. Carried away by curiosity, I stretched out my hand to take it, weigh it, fondle it. But the captain stopped me, signaled no, removed his dagger in one swift motion, and let the two valves snap shut. I then understood Captain Nemo's intent. By leaving the pearl buried beneath the giant clam's mantle, he allowed it to grow imperceptibly. With each passing year, the mollusk's secretions added new concentric layers. The captain alone was familiar with the cave where this wonderful fruit of nature was ripening. He alone reared it, so to speak, in order to transfer it one day to his dearly beloved museum. Perhaps, following the examples of oyster farmers in China and India, he had even predetermined the creation of this pearl by sticking under the mollusk's folds some piece of glass or metal that was gradually covered in mother-of-pearl. In any case, comparing this pearl to others I already knew about, and to those shimmering in the captain's collection, I estimated that it was worth at least ten million francs. It was a superb natural curiosity, rather than a luxurious piece of jewelry, because I don't know of any female ear that could handle it. Our visit to this opulent giant clan came to an end. Captain Nemo left the cave, and we climbed back up the bank of shellfish in the midst of these clear waters, not yet disturbed by divers at work. We walked by ourselves, genuine loiterers stopping or straying as our fancies dictated. For my part, I was no longer worried about those dangers my imagination had so ridiculously exaggerated. The shallows drew noticeably closer to the surface of the sea, and soon, walking in only a meter of water, my head passed well above the level of the ocean. Conseil rejoined me, and gluing his huge copper capsule to mine, his eyes gave me a friendly greeting. But this lofty plateau measured only a few fathoms, and soon we re-entered our element. I think I've now earned the right to dub it that. Ten minutes later, Captain Nemo stopped suddenly. I thought he called a halt so that we could turn and start back. No. With a gesture, he ordered us to crouch beside him at the foot of a wide crevice. His hand motioned toward a spot within the liquid mass, and I looked carefully. Five meters away, a shadow appeared and dropped to the seafloor. The alarming idea of sharks crossed my mind. But I was mistaken, and once again we didn't have to deal with monsters of the deep. It was a man, a living man, a black Indian fisherman, a poor devil who no doubt had come to gather what he could before harvest time. I saw the bottom of his dinghy, moored a few feet above his head. He would dive and go back up in quick succession. A stone cut in the shape of a sugar loaf, which he gripped between his feet while a rope connected it to his boat, served to lower him more quickly to the ocean floor. This was the extent of his equipment. Arriving on the sea floor at a depth of about five meters, he fell to his knees and stuffed his sack with shellfish gathered at random. Then he went back up, emptied his sack, pulled up his stone, and started all over again, the whole process lasting only thirty seconds. This diver didn't see us. A shadow cast by our crag hid us from his view. And besides, how could this poor Indian ever have guessed that human beings, creatures like himself, were near him under the waters, eavesdropping on his movements, not missing a single detail of his fishing? So he went up and down several times. He gathered only about ten shellfish per dive, because he had to tear them from the banks, where each clung with its tough mass of filaments. And how many of these oysters for which he risked his life would have no pearl in them? I observed him with great care. His movements were systematically executed, and for half an hour no danger seemed to threaten him. So I had gotten used to the sight of this fascinating fisherman when, all at once, just as the Indian was kneeling on the seafloor, I saw him make a frightened gesture, stand, and gather himself to spring back to the surface of the waves. I understood his fear. A gigantic shadow appeared above the poor diver. It was a shark, of huge size, moving in diagonally, eyes ablaze, jaws wide open. I was speechless with horror, unable to make a single movement. With one vigorous stroke of its fins, the voracious animal shot toward the Indian, who jumped aside and avoided the shark's bite, but not the thrashing of its tail, because that tail struck him across the chest and stretched him out on the sea floor. This scene lasted barely a few seconds. The shark returned, rolled over on its back, and was getting ready to cut the Indian in half, when Captain Nemo, who was stationed beside me, suddenly stood up. Then he strode right towards the monster, dagger in hand, ready to fight it at close quarters. Just as it was about to snap up the poor fisherman, the man-eater saw its new adversary, 
repositioned itself on its belly and headed swiftly toward him. I can see Captain Nemo's bearings to this day. Bracing himself, he waited for the fearsome man-eater with wonderful composure, and when the latter rushed at him, the captain leaped aside with prodigious quickness, avoided a collision, and sank his dagger into its belly. But that wasn't the end of the story. A dreadful battle was joined. The shark bellowed, so to speak. Blood was pouring into the waves from its wounds. The sea was dyed red, and through this opaque liquid I could see nothing else. Nothing else until the moment when, through a rift in the clouds, I saw the daring captain clinging to one of the animal's fins, fighting the monster at close quarters, belaboring his enemy's belly with stabs of the dagger, yet unable to deliver the deciding thrust. In other words, a direct hit to the heart. In its struggles the man-eater churned the watery mass so furiously its eddies threatened to knock me over. I wanted to run to the captain's rescue, but I was transfixed with horror, unable to move. I stared, wild-eyed. I saw the fight enter a new phase. The captain fell to the sea floor, toppled by the enormous mass weighing him down. Then the shark's jaws opened astonishingly wide, like a pair of industrial shears. And that would have been the finish of Captain Nemo had not Ned Land, quick as thought, rushed forward with his harpoon and driven its dreadful point into the shark's underside. The waves were saturated with masses of blood. The water shook with the movements of the man-eater, which thrashed about with indescribable fury. Ned Land hadn't missed his target. This was the monster's death rattle. Pierced to the heart, it was struggling with dreadful spasms whose aftershocks knocked Conseil off his feet. Meanwhile, Ned Land pulled the captain clear. Uninjured, the latter stood up, went right to the Indian, quickly cut the rope binding the man to his stone, took the fellow in his arms, and, with a vigorous kick of the heel, rose to the surface of the sea. The three of us followed him, and a few moments later, miraculously safe, we reached the fisherman's longboat. Captain Nemo's first concern was to revive this unfortunate man. I wasn't sure he would succeed. I hoped so, since the poor devil hadn't been under very long, but that stroke from the shark's tail could have been his death blow. Fortunately, after vigorous massaging by Conseil and the captain, I saw the nearly drowned man regain consciousness little by little. He opened his eyes. How startled he must have felt, how frightened even, at seeing four huge copper craniums leaning over him. And above all, what must he have thought when Captain Nemo pulled a bag of pearls from a pocket in his diving suit and placed it in the fisherman's hands? This magnificent benefaction from the man of the waters to the poor Indian from Ceylon was accepted by the latter with trembling hands. His bewildered eyes indicated that he didn't know to what superhuman creatures he owed both his life and his fortune. At the captain's signal we returned to the bank of shellfish, and retracing our steps we walked for half an hour until we encountered the anchor connecting the seafloor with the Nautilus's skiff. Back on board the sailors helped divest us of our heavy copper carapaces. Captain Nemo's first words were spoken to the Canadian. "'Thank you, Mr. Land,' he told him. "'Tit for tat, Captain,' Ned Land replied. "'I owed it to you.' The ghost of a smile glided across the captain's lips, and that was all. "'To the Nautilus,' he said. The longboat flew over the waves. A few minutes later we encountered the shark's corpse again, floating. From the black markings on the tips of its fins, I recognized the dreadful Squalus melanopterus from the seas of the East Indies, a variety in the species of sharks proper. It was more than twenty-five feet long. Its enormous mouth occupied a third of its body. It was an adult, as could be seen from the six rows of teeth forming an isosceles triangle in its upper jaw. Conseil looked at it with purely scientific fascination and I'm sure he placed it, not without good reason, in the class of cartilaginous fish, order Chondropterygia, with fixed gills, family Silesia, genus Squalus. While I was contemplating this inert mass, suddenly a dozen of these voracious Melanoptera appeared around our longboat, but, paying no attention to us, they pounced on the corpse and quarreled over every scrap of it. By 8.30 we were back on board the Nautilus. There I fell to thinking about the incidents that marked our excursion over the Manark Oyster Bank. Two impressions inevitably stood out. One concerned Captain Nemo's matchless bravery, the other his devotion to a human being, a representative of that race from which he had fled beneath the seas. In spite of everything, this strange man hadn't yet succeeded in completely stifling his heart. When I shared these impressions with him, he answered me in a tone touched with emotion. 
that Indian professor lives in the land of the oppressed, and I am to this day, and will be until my last breath, a native of that same land. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 The Red Sea During the day of January 29, the island of Ceylon disappeared below the horizon, and at a speed of twenty miles per hour, the Nautilus glided into the labyrinthine channels that separate the Maldive and Lacadive Islands. It likewise hugged Kilton Island, a shore of madreporic origin discovered by Vasco da Gama in 1499, and one of nineteen chief islands in the island group of the Lacadives located between latitude 10 degrees and 14 degrees 30 minutes north, and between longitude 50 degrees 72 minutes and 69 degrees east. By then we had fared 16,220 miles, or 7,500 leagues, from our starting point in the seas of Japan. The next day, January 30, when the Nautilus rose to the surface of the ocean, there was no more land in sight. Setting its course to the north-northwest, the ship headed toward the Gulf of Oman, carved out between Arabia and the Indian Peninsula, and providing access to the Persian Gulf. This was obviously a blind alley with no possible outlet. So where was Captain Nemo taking us? I was unable to say which didn't satisfy the Canadian, who that day asked me where we were going. We're going, Mr. Ned, where the captain's fancy takes us. His fancy, the Canadian replied, won't take us very far. The Persian Gulf has no outlet, and if we enter those waters, it won't be long before we return in our tracks. All right, we'll return, Mr. Land, and after the Persian Gulf, if the Nautilus wants to visit the Red Sea, the Strait of Bab el-Mandeb is still there to let us in. I don't have to tell you, sir, Ned Land replied, that the Red Sea is just as landlocked as the Gulf, since the Isthmus of Suez hasn't been cut all the way through yet, and even if it was, a boat as secretive as ours wouldn't risk a canal intersected with locks, so the Red Sea won't be our way back to Europe either but I didn't say we'd return to Europe. What do you figure, then? I figure that after visiting these unusual waterways of Arabia and Egypt, the Nautilus will go back down to the Indian Ocean, perhaps through Mozambique Channel, perhaps off the Mascarene Islands, and then make for the Cape of Good Hope. And once we're at the Cape of Good Hope, the Canadian asked with typical persistence, Well, then... We'll enter that Atlantic Ocean with which we aren't yet familiar. What's wrong, Ned, my friend? Are you tired of this voyage under the seas? Are you bored with the constantly changing sight of these underwater wonders? Speaking for myself, I'll be extremely distressed to see the end of a voyage so few men will ever have a chance to make. But don't you realize, Professor Aronnax, the Canadian replied, that soon will have been imprisoned for three whole months aboard this Nautilus. No, Ned, I didn't realize it. I don't want to realize it, and I don't keep track of every day and every hour. But when will it be over? In its appointed time. Meanwhile, there's nothing we can do about it, and our discussions are futile. My gallant Ned, if you come and tell me a chance to escape is available to us, then I'll discuss it with you. But that isn't the case, and, in all honesty, I don't think Captain Nemo ever ventures into European seas. This short dialogue reveals that in my mania for the Nautilus, I was turning into the spitting image of its commander. As for Ned Land, he ended our talk in his best speechifying style. That's all fine and dandy, but in my humble opinion, a life in jail is a life without joy. For four days until February 3, the Nautilus inspected the Gulf of Oman at various speeds and depths. It seemed to be traveling at random, as if hesitating over which course to follow, but it never crossed the Tropic of Cancer. After leaving this gulf, we raised Muscat for an instant, the most important town in the country of Oman. 
I marveled at its strange appearance in the midst of the black rocks surrounding it, against which the white of its houses and forts stood out sharply. I spotted the rounded domes of its mosques, the elegant tips of its minarets, and its fresh leafy terraces. But it was only a fleeting vision, and the Nautilus soon sank beneath the dark waves of these waterways. Then our ship went along at a distance of six miles from the Arabic coasts of Mara and Hadramaut, their undulating lines of mountains relieved by a few ancient ruins. On February 5 we finally put into the Gulf of Aden, a genuine funnel stuck into the neck of Bab el Mandab and bottling these Indian waters in the Red Sea. On February 6, the Nautilus cruised in sight of the city of Aden, perched on a promontory connected to the continent by a narrow isthmus, a sort of inaccessible Gibraltar whose fortifications the English rebuilt after capturing it in 1839. I glimpsed the octagonal minarets of this town, which used to be one of the wealthiest, busiest commercial centers along this coast, as the Arab historian Idrisi tells it. I was convinced that when Captain Nemo reached this point, he would back out again, but I was mistaken, and much to my surprise, he did nothing of the sort. The next day, February 7, we entered the Strait of Bab al Mandeb, whose name means Gate of Tears in the Arabic language. Twenty miles wide, it's only fifty-two kilometers long, and with the Nautilus launched at full speed, clearing it was the work of barely an hour. But I didn't see a thing, not even Param Island, where the British government built fortifications to strengthen Aden's position. There were many English and French steamers plowing this narrow passageway, liners going from Suez to Bombay, Calcutta, Melbourne, Reunion Island, and Maritus, far too much traffic for the Nautilus to make an appearance on the surface, so it wisely stayed in midwater. Finally, at noon, we were plowing the waves of the Red Sea. The Red Sea, that great lake so famous in biblical traditions, seldom replenished by rains, fed by no important rivers, continually drained by a high rate of evaporation, its water level dropping a meter and a half every year. If it were fully landlocked like a lake, this odd gulf might dry up completely. On this score it's inferior to its neighbors, the Caspian Sea and the Dead Sea, whose levels lower only to the point where their evaporation exactly equals the amount of water they take to their hearts. This Red Sea is 2,600 kilometers long, with an average width of 240. In the days of the Ptolemies and the Roman emperors, it was a great commercial artery for the world, and when its isthmus has been cut through, it will completely regain that bygone importance that the Suez railways have always brought back in part. I would not even attempt to understand the whim that induced Captain Nemo to take us into this gulf, but I wholeheartedly approved of the Nautilus's entering it. It adopted a medium pace, sometimes staying on the surface, sometimes diving to avoid some ship, and so I could observe both the inside and top side of this highly unusual sea. On February 8, as early as the first hours of daylight, Mocha appeared before us, a town now in ruins whose walls would collapse at the mere sound of a cannon, and which shelters a few leafy date trees here and there. This once important city used to contain six public market places plus twenty-six mosques, and its walls, protected by fourteen forts, fashioned a three-kilometer girdle around it. Then the Nautilus drew near the beaches of Africa, where the sea is considerably deeper. There, through the open panels in a midwater of crystal clarity, our ship enabled us to study wonderful bushes of shining coral and huge chunks of rock wrapped in splendid green furs of algae and fucus. What an indescribable sight, and what a variety of settings and scenery were these reefs and volcanic islands leveled off by the Libyan coast. 
But soon the Nautilus hugged the eastern shore where these tree forms appeared in all their glory. This was off the coast of Tehama, and there such zoophyte displays not only flourished below sea level, but they also fashioned picturesque networks that unreeled as high as ten fathoms above it. The latter were more whimsical, but less colorful than the former, which kept their bloom thanks to the moist vitality of the waters. How many delightful hours I spent in this way at the lounge window! How many new specimens of underwater flora and fauna I marveled at beneath the light of our electric beacon! Mushroom-shaped fungus coral, some slate-colored sea anemone, including the species Thalassianthus aster, among others, organ-pipe coral arranged like flutes and just begging for a puff from the god Pan, shells unique to the sea that dwell in madreporic cavities and whose bases are twisted into squat spirals, and finally a thousand samples of a polypary I hadn't observed until then, the common sponge. First division in the polyp group, the class Spongiaria has been created by scientists precisely for this unusual exhibit whose usefulness is beyond dispute. The sponge is definitely not a plant, as some naturalists still believe, but an animal of the lowest order, a polypary inferior even to coral. Its animal nature isn't in doubt, and we can't accept even the views of the ancients who regarded it as halfway between plant and animal. But I must say that naturalists are not in agreement on the structural mode of sponges. For some, it's a polypary, and for others, such as Professor Milne Edwards, it's a single, solitary individual. The class Spongiaria contains about 300 species that are encountered in a large number of seas and even in certain streams, where they've been given the name freshwater sponges. But their waters of choice are the Red Sea and the Mediterranean near the Greek islands or the coast of Syria. These waters witness the reproduction and growth of soft, delicate bath sponges whose prices run as high as 150 francs apiece. The yellow sponge from Syria, the horn sponge from Barbary, etc. But since I had no hope of studying these zoophytes in the seaports of the Levant, from which we were separated by the insuperable isthmus of Suez, I had to be content with observing them in the waters of the Red Sea. So I called Conseil to my side, while at an average depth of eight to nine meters the Nautilus slowly skimmed every beautiful rock on the easterly coast. There sponges grew in every shape, globular, stalk-like, leaf-like, finger-like. With reasonable accuracy, they lived up to their nicknames of basket sponges, chalice sponges, distaff sponges, elk horn sponges, lion's paws, peacock's tails, and Neptune's gloves, designations bestowed on them by fishermen more poetically inclined than scientists. A gelatinous semi-fluid substance coated the fibrous tissue of these sponges, and from this tissue there escaped a steady trickle of water that, after carrying sustenance to each cell, was being expelled by a contracting movement. This jelly-like substance disappears when the polyp dies, emitting ammonia as it rots. Finally, nothing remains but the fibers, either gelatinous or made of horn, that constitute your household sponge, which takes on a russet hue and is used for various tasks depending on its degree of elasticity, permeability, or resistance to saturation. These polyparies were sticking to rocks, shells of mollusks, and even the stalks of water plants. They adorned the smallest crevices, some sprawling, others standing or hanging like coral outgrowths. I told Consile that sponges are fished up in two ways, either by dragnet or by hand. The latter method calls for the services of a diver, but it's preferable because it spares the polypary's tissue, leaving it with a much higher market value. Other zoophytes swarming near the sponges consisted chiefly of a very elegant species of jellyfish. Mollusks were represented by varieties of squid that, according to Professor Orbigny, are unique to the Red Sea, and reptiles by vergata turtles belonging to the genus Chelonia, which furnished our table with a dainty but wholesome dish. As for fish, they were numerous and often remarkable. Here are the ones that the Nautilus's nets most frequently hauled on board. 
rays, including spotted rays that were oval in shape and brick red in color, their bodies strewn with erratic blue speckles and identifiable by their jagged double stings, silver-backed skates, common sting rays with stippled tails, butterfly rays that looked like huge two-meter cloaks flapping at mid-depth, toothless guitar fish that were a type of cartilaginous fish closer to the shark, trunk fish known as dromedaries that were one and a half feet long and had humps ending in backward curving stings, serpentine moray eels with silver tails and bluish backs, plus brown pectorals trimmed in gray piping, a species of butterfish called the fiatola decked out in thin gold stripes and the three colors of the French flag, Montague Blennies, four centimeters long, superb jacks, handsomely embellished by seven black crosswise streaks with blue and yellow fins, plus gold and silver scales, snooks, standard mullet with yellow heads, parrotfish, wrasse, triggerfish, gobies, etc., plus a thousand other fish common to the oceans we had already crossed. On February 9, the Nautilus cruised in the widest part of the Red Sea, measuring 190 miles straight across from Suakin on the west coast to Kunfidha on the east coast. At noon that day, after our position fix, Captain Nemo climbed onto the platform where I happened to be. I vowed not to let him go below again without at least sounding him out on his future plans, as soon as he saw me, he came over, graciously offered me a cigar, and said to me, "'Well, Professor, are you pleased with this Red Sea? Have you seen enough of its hidden wonders, its fish and zoophytes, its gardens of sponges and forests of coral? Have you glimpsed the towns built on its shores?' "'Yes, Captain Nemo,' I replied, "'and the Nautilus is wonderfully suited to this whole survey. Ah, it's a clever boat!' Yes, sir, clever, daring, and invulnerable. It fears neither the Red Sea's dreadful storms nor its currents and reefs. Indeed, I said, this sea is mentioned as one of the worst, and in the days of the ancients, if I'm not mistaken, it had an abominable reputation. Thoroughly abominable, Professor Aronnax. The Greek and Latin historians can find nothing to say in its favor, and the Greek geographer Strabo adds that it's especially rough during the rainy season and the period of summer prevailing winds. The Arabidrisi, referring to it by the name Gulf of Colzum, relates that ships perished in large numbers on its sandbanks, and that no one risked navigating it by night. This, he claims, is a sea subject to fearful hurricanes, strewn with inhospitable islands, and with nothing good to offer, either on its surface or in its depths. As a matter of fact, the same views can also be found in Arian, Agatharchides, and Artemidorus. One can easily see, I answered, that those historians didn't navigate aboard the Nautilus. Indeed, the captain replied with a smile, and in this respect the moderns aren't much farther along than the ancients. It took many centuries to discover the mechanical power of steam. Who knows whether we'll see a second Nautilus within the next one hundred years? Progress is slow, Professor Aronnax. It's true, I replied. Your ship is a century ahead of its time, perhaps several centuries. It would be most unfortunate if such a secret were to die with its inventor. Captain Nemo did not reply. After some minutes of silence, We were discussing, he said, the views of ancient historians on the dangers of navigating this Red Sea. True, I replied, but weren't their fears exaggerated? Yes and no, Professor Aronnax, answered Captain Nemo, who seemed to know his Red Sea by heart. To a modern ship, well-rigged, solidly constructed, and in control of its course, thanks to obedient steam, some conditions are no longer hazardous that offer all sorts of dangers to the vessels of the ancients. Picture those early navigators venturing forth in sailboats built from planks lashed together with palm-tree ropes, caulked with powdered resin, and coated with dogfish grease. They didn't even have instruments for taking their bearings. They went by guesswork in the midst of currents they barely knew. Under such conditions, shipwrecks had to be numerous. 
But nowadays, steamers providing service between Suez and the South Seas have nothing to fear from the fury of this Gulf, despite the contrary winds of its monsoons. Their captains and passengers no longer prepare for departure with sacrifices to placate the gods, and after returning, they don't trapes in wreaths and gold ribbons to say thanks at the local temple. Agreed, I said. And steam seems to have killed off all gratitude in seamen's hearts. But since you seem to have made a special study of the sea, Captain, can you tell me how it got its name? Many explanations exist on the subject, Professor Aronnax. Would you like to hear the views of one chronicler in the fourteenth century? Gladly. This fanciful fellow claims the sea was given its name after the crossing of the Israelites. When the Pharaoh perished in those waves that came together again at Moses' command, to mark that miraculous sequel, the sea turned a red without equal. Thus, no other course would do but to name it for its hue. An artistic explanation, Captain Nemo. I replied, but I'm unable to rest content with it. So I'll ask you for your own personal views. Here they come. To my thinking, Professor Aronnax, this Red Sea designation must be regarded as a translation of the Hebrew word Edrom, and if the ancients gave it that name, it was because of the unique color of its waters. Until now, however, I've only seen clear waves without any hue. Surely, but as we move ahead to the far end of this gulf, you'll note its odd appearance. I recall seeing the bay of El Tur completely red, like a lake of blood. And you attribute this color to the presence of microscopic algae? Yes, it's a purplish, mucilaginous substance produced by those tiny buds known by the name Trichodesmia, forty thousand of which are needed to occupy the space of one square millimeter. Perhaps you'll encounter them when we reach El Tur. Hence, Captain Nemo, this isn't the first time you've gone through the Red Sea aboard the Nautilus. No, sir. Then, since you've already mentioned the crossing of the Israelites and the catastrophe that befell the Egyptians, I would ask if you've ever discovered any traces under the waters of that great historic event. No, Professor, and for an excellent reason. What's that? It's because that same locality where Moses crossed with all his people is now so clogged with sand, camels can barely get their legs wet. You can understand that my Nautilus wouldn't have enough water for itself. And that locality is, I asked. That locality lies a little above Suez in a sound that used to form a deep estuary when the Red Sea stretched as far as the Bitter Lakes. Now, whether or not their crossing was literally miraculous, the Israelites did cross there in returning to the Promised Land, and the Pharaoh's army did perish at precisely that locality. So I think that excavating those sands would bring to light a great many weapons and tools of Egyptian origin. Obviously, I replied, and for the sake of archaeology, let's hope that sooner or later such excavations do take place. Once new towns are settled on the isthmus after the Suez Canal has been cut through, a canal, by the way, of little use to a ship such as the Nautilus. Surely, but of great use to the world at large, Captain Nemo said. The ancients well understood the usefulness to commerce of connecting the Red Sea with the Mediterranean, but they never dreamed of cutting a canal between the two, and instead they picked the Nile as their link. If we can trust tradition, it was probably Egypt's king Sesostris who started digging the canal needed to join the Nile with the Red Sea. What's certain is that in 615 B.C., King Necho II was hard at work on a canal that was fed by Nile water and ran through the Egyptian plains opposite Arabia. This canal could be traveled in four days, and it was so wide, two triple-tiered galleys could pass through it abreast. Its construction was continued by Darius the Great, son of Hystaspes, and probably completed by King Ptolemy the Second. Strabo saw it used for shipping, but the weakness of its slope between its starting point near Bubastis and the Red Sea left it navigable only a few months out of the year. This canal served commerce until the century of Rome's Antonine emperors. 
It was then abandoned and covered with sand, subsequently reinstated by Arabia's Caliph Omar I, and finally filled in for good in 761 or 762 A.D. by Caliph al-Mansur, in an effort to prevent supplies from reaching Muhammad ibn Abdullah, who had rebelled against him. During his Egyptian campaign, your General Napoleon Bonaparte discovered traces of this old canal in the Suez Desert, and when the tide caught him by surprise, he well-nigh perished just a few hours before rejoining his regiment at Had Jarath, the very place where Moses had pitched camp 3,300 years before him. Well, Captain, what the ancients hesitated to undertake, Monsieur de Lesseps is now finishing up. His joining of these two seas will shorten the route from Cadiz to the East Indies by 9,000 kilometers, and he'll soon change Africa into an immense island. Yes, Professor Aronnax, and you have every right to be proud of your fellow countrymen. Such a man brings a nation more honor than the greatest commanders. Like so many others, he began with difficulties and setbacks, but he triumphed because he has the volunteer spirit. And it's sad to think that this deed, which should have been an international deed, which would have ensured that any administration went down in history, will succeed only through the efforts of one man. So, all hail to Monsieur de Lesseps. Yes, all hail to that great French citizen, I replied, quite startled by how emphatically the Captain Nemo had just spoken. Unfortunately, he went on, I can't take you through that Suez Canal, but the day after tomorrow you'll be able to see the long jetties of Port Said when we're in the Mediterranean. In the Mediterranean? I exclaimed. Yes, Professor, does that amaze you? What amazes me is thinking we'll be there the day after tomorrow. Oh, really? Yes, Captain, although since I've been aboard your vessel I should have formed the habit of not being amazed by anything. But what is it that startles you? The thought of how hideously fast the Nautilus will need to go if it's to double the Cape of Good Hope, circle around Africa, and lie in the open Mediterranean by the day after tomorrow. And who says it will circle Africa, Professor? What's this talk about doubling the Cape of Good Hope? But unless the Nautilus navigates on dry land and crosses over the Isthmus, or under it, Professor Aronnax, Under it? Surely. Captain Nemo replied serenely, Under that tongue of land nature long ago made what man today is making on its surface. What? There's a passageway? Yes, an underground passageway that I've named the Arabian Tunnel. It starts below Suez and leads to the Bay of Pelusium. But isn't that isthmus only composed of quicksand? To a certain depth, but at merely fifty meters one encounters a firm foundation of rock. And it's by luck that you discovered this passageway? I asked, more and more startled. Luck plus logic, Professor, and logic even more than luck. Captain, I hear you, but I can't believe my ears. Oh, sir, the old saying still holds true. Ores habent et non audient. Translation, they have ears, but hear not. Not only does this passageway exist, but I've taken advantage of it on several occasions. Without it, I wouldn't have ventured today into such a blind alley as the Red Sea. Is it indiscreet to ask how you discovered this tunnel? Sir, the captain answered me, there can be no secrets between men who will never leave each other. I ignored this innuendo and waited for Captain Nemo's explanation. Professor, he told me, the simple logic of the naturalist led me to discover this passageway, and I alone am familiar with it. I'd noted that in the Red Sea and the Mediterranean there exist a number of absolutely identical species of fish. Eels, butterfish, greenfish, bass, jewelfish, flying fish. Certain of this fact, I wondered if there weren't a connection between the two seas. If there were... Its underground current had to go from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean simply because of their difference in level. So I caught a large number of fish in the vicinity of Suez. I slipped copper rings around their tails and tossed them back into the sea. A few months later, off the coast of Syria, I recaptured a few specimens of my fish adorned with their telltale rings, 
so this proved to me that some connection existed between the two seas. I searched for it with my nautilus. I discovered it. I ventured into it. And soon, Professor, you also will have cleared my Arabic tunnel. End of chapter 4